So, um, first of all, um, again, you're all very welcome um, this evening. Thanks for coming along. Um, you're very welcome to our adult webinar series. Um, my name is Nicola Began, and I'm one of the adult dyslexia coordinators here at DAI. DAI. So we're delighted to welcome Dave Cormack as part of our webinar series. So Dave, he is a lecturer in business and a program director of the MBA in business management at the National College of Ireland. So prior to taking up his position in NCI, Dave spent a very successful 30 years in tech. He worked for Telecom Erin and also EMC Corporation. So during this one hour session, Dave is going to explore his journey as an unidentified dyslexic through education. So that's primary, secondary education, and then in the workplace as well. He'll also look at the importance of building resilience and trusting your own coping mechanisms. He'll look at a few seminal moments, as well as a light bulb moment, discovering his love for computer code and how this was a catalyst for his thriving career in tech and academia. So with further ado, I will now hand you over to Dave. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Nicola. You're very welcome. Uh, and thank you to yourself and Quiva. They've spent the last 15 minutes putting me at ease mm -hmm. in, the, in the green room, shall we say. Uh, so it's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming along. Uh, and thanks to the Dyslexia Association for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. Uh, I need to say at the outset, dyslexics are very verbal, and that's a common thread throughout this series of uh, webinars, and uh, so I do talk. Um, an hour is a long time, but it's also a very short time. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to explain dyslexia, or my, my uh, experience of dyslexia, and then over the course of the evening, I talk about my school from day one right through to the end, um, about seminal moments in, in my dyslexic journey, my rather circuitous career journey, uh, some reflections. I'm gonna talk about dyslexic thinking because it's very much uh, the, the thing of the moment. I'm gonna share a little bit of poetry as uh, a means to explain my journey. And uh, I, I, I took to writing poetry about a year ago, a year and a bit ago, and I have two poems to share with you tonight. And we'll have some questions and discussions. And Jane McGrath in one of the previous webinars said, she can only talk from her experience and that's all I can do. I'm telling my story. A Little bit about dyslexia before we start. It is a recognized disability and that, that's a fact. And it's not that we can't read, we read differently. We also think differently and most importantly, we learn differently. And we, we are part of uh, the neurodiverse community and uh, it needs to be recognised. We need to recognise it ourselves. And I think the education system needs to recognise the fact that we think and learn differently. We start off in school and I'll start on my first day in school. I'm from Leeks of County Kildare, which uh, when I started school in 1965 at the age of four, uh, was a small country village. And I went to a three room school. I started on my fourth birthday, which was in January or a little bit before it. And I'm not sure why that happened. I have a feeling it was an effort to maintain teacher numbers in the school and uh, children were, were started on their, the, the day of their fourth birthday or around about then. The principal was an older uh, person who, uh, who was a bit hard of hearing and he made a mistake on my year of birth and put me down as a five-year-old. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he may well have put me down as five because he, he needed numbers at that age. I started school uh, within the first week, there were a couple of relevant things to dyslexia that, that happened. Uh, first one was numbers. There were numbers down the wall of the room. There wasn't a lot of decoration in the room, but one through to 10 down along the wall with little buttons underneath, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can still remember one to seven. Can't see eight, nine, and 10. I can remember seeing that uh, the even numbers like two, four, and six had a perfection about them. Three was diagonal, which, which caused me a problem. But on the day and on the first day, I remarked on the numbers and said to the teacher that uh, they, the numbers represented the number of, of balls. And she said, uh, this fellow's half, halfway there. There won't be much teaching on, me, on him. And that kind of put me back in my box when I was thinking, ooh, maybe this is not a place that you should express yourself. Uh, the second thing happened in the first week was uh, there was a huge preoccupation with marching when I went to national school. I used to march around the yard before we went in. And I couldn't get the, the marching bit. 
I used to swing my arms uh, in, not in sync with my legs. And the old principal came to me and kind of told me I couldn't walk. Uh, and uh, this caused a problem. I went home, told my mother that I couldn't walk. And uh, I can still remember her teaching me to march up and down the, the floor, showing me how you put one arm out and the other arm back. And that isn't an uncommon dyslexic trait, a little bit of awkwardness, a little bit of difficulty. But the most important thing that came out of that was, and I think it's hugely important, is parental support. My mother knew nothing of the dyslexia, but she was there and supported me and uh, carried on the teaching that she had done up to now. And that, that's an important aspect. Progressing through, we spent three years with the same teacher and uh, through to first class, I had developed, I have no memory of letters at all, no memory of learning to read. And in fact, uh, because I was only six months of baby infants, I often prior to diagnosis thought that I just missed the, the time when you learn to read. But I, I developed a system of anonymity, particularly when it came to, to reading. And there's any fans of Star Trek out there, it was like uh, engaging a cloaking device. I could, uh, could, could become anonymous and wouldn't get asked to read. I wouldn't get asked words. And that was a strategy I used and used all the way through school. As I said, numbers meant something to me. And that's just me. I, I'm pretty good on numbers. And uh, the teacher was teaching us and to, to uh, multiply by seven. We used to learn it off by heart. This is the, the situation. We learned our tables off by heart. And I felt that was futile. I had realized that multiplication was down to three numbers in my head, so in my head folks, uh, two, five, and 10. And if you can multiply by two, five, and 10, you can multiply by anything because the rest of it is all addition. Uh, this is at age of five or six. Uh, we are learning seven times tables and we're learning them by heart. It's seven ones are seven, seven twos are 14, seven threes are 21. And uh, this to me was futile. And I was looking out the window and enjoying a daydream. I can still remember the daydream. I was daydreaming about a bird, that the bird was singing, and I couldn't understand the language the bird was speaking. The teacher, bless her, she was looking after three classes, uh, babies high in first class. So difficult job for her. And she brought me back to earth very quickly and uh, said to me, I suppose you know your seven times tables. And I said, yes, I do. So she decided to test me there and then. And I could still remember this vividly. She says, what, seven eights? And I thought for a minute, I said 56. And she looked around seven fours and I said 28. And there was a delay each time. And the delay was because the way my head works is based on seven times eight is actually 40 plus 56. So it's five times eight plus eight plus eight. Uh, she decided that there was somebody whispering behind me. So she went behind and uh, asked uh, the next one seven times nine, as it happens, which is 70 minus seven, which is 63. Again, my head works that way. And then she asked me the, the ultimate multiplication question is what is 12 times 11? Oh, that is right. And um, it's 120 plus 11, which is 100, uh, sorry, uh, 12 times 11 is 110 plus 12, 122, uh, which seems odd. And I answered it. So she left me at that and said, um, daydreaming will get you nowhere. Now, the point I want to make here is that daydreaming, I think, is a much more productive exercise than learning seven times tables. And certainly was for me. Um, had she asked me what's 28 times 17, I would also have answered her after a slow delay by saying it's 476, which 280 plus 140 plus 56. Uh, and that's the way my head works. I don't think that that is the way everybody learns tables, but it's the way I learned them. And that was a kind of, a, a, again, a learning exercise for me uh, to, uh, of, of how my head was working. Progressing then uh, through National School, we, we arrived into our next teacher who was a great proponent of corporal punishment. He believed in the use of his fists and sticks, and we lived in a world of fear. And I absolutely perfected the art of anonymity here. Numbers again, though, were, were important. I learned to divide and multiply by old, old money, uh, which is, uh, those who don't remember pounds, shillings and pence, uh, 12 pence a shilling, 20 shillings a pound, and then the pounds are based on decimal. Um, I could do that, and I can remember there was some, it, particular division, we used to draw circles and add numbers in. I used to do that after the fact, and uh, because I couldn't see the point to it. Again, not recognized, but maintained my anonymity. Just one story here uh, around dyslexic thinking is about the age of seven uh, with this teacher. Um, and uh, Keith Murphy mentions in his talk about, we sometimes don't put our heads above the trench for fear of getting shot. And in this instance, uh, 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 the, the teacher was uh, 
taking us from religious instruction. And uh, needles featured very much in our religious instruction. I can remember him telling us there was uh, more, all the souls in heaven could fit on the pin of a needle. And then the next one was, and I looked this up recently, Matthew 1924, which is about how it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he must have caught me thinking or looking, and he said, Do you, is there something about that? And as a dyslexic thinker and a problem solver, I kind of immediately thought, yeah, let's make a bigger needle. And um, so the camel could fit through. And he lost it. He, um, in fact, his rage was such that he, he, he came to me. I thought I was going to get a, an awful beating. But his rage was such that he, he couldn't control himself and wasn't able to beat me as he had intended. So uh, again, uh, dyslexic thinking, I broke my anonymity and uh, it didn't work for me. Working my way through uh, national school, fifth class, new teacher, principal, charming man, but quite nasty. He picked on children with issues. Anonymity became a huge strategy for me. Um, I then made a peculiar thing. I went to, to, to Connemara to the ghetto for the months of January, February, and March, and uh, experienced the Irish language. And this is relevant to, to the education system as well. But uh, while I was there, and certainly when I came back, I realized that this uh, principal's Irish wasn't quite as good as he thought it was. And I developed another strategy. I'm not really proud of this strategy, but uh, he, during Irish class, he would ask me a question, and I would turn up the, the speed, I would give him the Connemara Bloss, and it really put him under pressure. So uh, it, it was another strategy to, to not be uh, put under pressure in school and use something I had that he didn't have but that became uh, relevant again as I progressed through secondary school. Secondary school then, age 11, 1972, new subjects, fitting in easily, developing oral perception. So developing a learning through uh, that oral perception and doing pretty okay. The biggest single fear a dyslexic has, certainly in, in secondary school, is being asked to read out loud. Um, and that, again, I used the, the strategy of uh, maybe putting the teacher in the pressure, daring them to ask me to read out loud and also anonymity. Another absurdity of our system is uh, I was fluent in the Irish language at this point, and I went into uh, to further develop that language uh, to be put learning utterly pointless. And uh, I think it, it is, we should look at the Irish language and, and think it, it must be the most resilient thing uh, ever because we've been trying to kill it now for 100 years and we haven't succeeded and if we could make a change uh, to our education system maybe to teach people to speak the language and encourage speaking the language and think about reading it and writing it afterwards it would be a uh, progress and that theme comes out a lot in education we we talk about how uh, what's good for dys dyslexics can be good for everybody and i, I have a feeling that if, if we focused on that form of communication rather than reading and writing. We don't teach babies to read and write, we teach them to speak or they learn to speak from us. So I think that that, that is something that we need to look at from our education system. Back in secondary school, uh, second year I'm doing very well uh, at the start. I'm very engaging maths and science teachers and a number of our speakers mentioned how somebody taking an interest or somebody showing an interest really makes a difference. And that does, I did for me, maths teacher, science teacher, really showing an interest in me. Cracks are beginning to appear though now. Uh, I'm scoring A's in maths and science, failing French and history. So we can see the pattern here. French and history require reading. I'm not reading anything. And uh, that's, that's beginning to, to cause a problem. There's another uh, issue. I remember the science teacher was excellent. He, he taught us. Um, about light and uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, colours of the rainbow, which uh, he taught us from the perspective of infrared through green all the way across to violet. And then somebody gave us this uh, monomic uh, Richard of York gives battle in vain. I got it right. Now I have to reverse engineer red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet into that. So Jane McGrath you know, mentions that monomics work for her, don't work for me. So what's coming out here is you know, whatever works for you is what what we need to, to focus on. The doing well then in secondary school caused a new enemy to emerge and uh, a, a darkness to come in, in my education journey. And again, going back to Keith Murphy, I, I put my head up above the trench and I certainly uh, got shot. 
And I'm going to I'm going to share that moment with you through uh, poetry. Um, it's a poem I wrote uh, about a year ago, and it's about uh, about that 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 time and that end of second year in in secondary school. A point when I was about to go off the educational cliff, and uh, there was there was an enemy emerging. I just talk about poetry and why is poetry? I think poetry is a really important tool for for dyslexics. Uh, first off, poetry is described as an economy of words. And although we're verbal, reading is, is different for us. And certainly most of us have difficulty in writing and in producing written script. So an economy of words straight off is something that is, is, is made for a dyslexic. Poetry, again, a good friend of mine who's read all of my poems, I think, uh, she sent me some definitions and uh, of, of poetry. And she uh, said that Lawrence Ferlinghetti is, uh, he describes poetry as the shortest distance between two humans. Again, in communication terms, creating that shortness of distance and uh, facilitating communication. And then what I think one of the most important one is Seamus Healy's definition or Seamus Healy's thoughts. And he says that the completely solitary self, that's where poetry comes from. It gets isolated by crisis, and those crises are often intimate also. I think that's really, really a uh, beautiful piece of words. And, you know, poetry then gives us the opportunity to express ourselves in an economy of words and maybe uh, examine those crises that have hit us. It's a really dyslexic thing to do. I've chosen my style of poetry to be, I call it the Shannos Nancy style of poetry. poetry. I can do rhyme. I do acrostics sometimes, but uh, I, I prefer free form. I've been composing poetry for years, but I started to write it when I was 60. Actually, the, the night I was 60, I was tossing and turning and I, I, I started writing poetry and I've written some since then. So I'm going to share this poem just to give you a sense of, of uh, a troubled, a difficult uh, young person in school. The morning of the maths results was a warm and humid day. He arrived with all the glamour of a high court lawyer, evidence bundle under arm. Despite his dour demeanor, he was really quite okay. A man with a vocation to make us learn our sums. The room was high on testosterone and the prefab didn't help by making things more humid than the outside day required. His, hire, his arrival in the room caused a hush to descend and we settled to anticipate his verdict on our work. He started with the lower ones, calling surnames with his low dismissive voice. 34, 37, 41, 41, 43, and on and on. 45, 46, 48, 52, and on and on and on. I waited in the knowledge that it would be another while before he got to me. He slowly and dismissively made his way through the class. The numbers getting higher, his monotone still the same. 62, 73, 73, 78, 80. 80 was an older boy who exuded pompous pride at being the best in class. But in his pompousness, he hadn't done the maths. There was one more score to come, just one more, and that was me. I dared a look as he cleared his throat to deliver the best and last result. There was a momentary stall, and deep within those dark blue eyes, a glimmer, just the slightest lowering of the dour demeanour to sing was well done. He rasped my sword in the note of the mark, 96. To the backdrop of a collective sharp intake of juvenile breath, my thoughts were only for the missing four. I wish it ended there, but after class eight, he came for me. He pinned me up against the wall with his sweaty palm around my throat. Where did you have the book was all he could summon from within his bursting rage. Such a question only demonstrated that he really wasn't worthy of his eighty. I hope he learned as much as me on that humid day in May. Okay, we leave that uh, there. I hope you get a sense of, of uh, the difficulty that, that is achieved in the education system. Let's go now to seminal, my first seminal moment. And this is the start of my career, June 1973, age 12. And like many, much of my career, a set of circumstances uh, created an opportunity for me. My cousin had uh, gotten a job serving tables at a pub. He was going to meet his cousins from the other side in, in England, and uh, I was to step in and replace him. 
And up to this point, I feel in life, I had been allocated a seat that was behind the pillar. I was behind that pillar, had to look around the pillar to see what was going on and I could hide behind the pillar as well. I landed in the pub and I met a, a, an amazing teacher, Pat Jagobon, I think he's here. I've got a name check him because he had a huge influence on me. And he introduced a new word to the lexicon of education from my perspective. And the word was because. He taught me uh, how, what was needed, taught me how to perform a highly skilled job, which is serving tables. And uh, I'll give you an example. He told me how to order a round of drinks by ordering pints of Guinness first, then pints of other uh, beers. And during the pints of the other beers, order the shorts. And he kind of went through that. He said, you do this because the pints will need to settle. I can pull the other pints while I'm getting the shorts and you load them onto the tray. He taught me how to use a float. I took it up very, very quickly. And uh, I, I, I was a sponge to learn the trade and the skills of working in a pub. Uh, progressed through, I could, I could, uh, le- could order, but I could also manage uh, to, to remember big orders. Again, memory is not something that's associated with dyslexics, but in my situation, I would picture the table and picture the drinks with the individuals at the table and then uh, order drink and order correctly. Learned by listening and watching, watching what was going on, listening what's going on. I'm in this world that I don't need to read. There's no book, there's no manual for, for what I'm doing at all. And uh, I was very successful. I was quite good at uh, serving tables. I progressed to become a barman at the age of 14. And uh, I actually spent a small time in another highly skilled job uh, working as a bouncer at the age of 16, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's an interesting time to be doing that. And I can tell you the lessons I learned over the course of the years I worked in that pub are informing my work now more than anything I learned in school, which I was doing at the same time. I teach through the method of storytelling and those stories are still there and they're still happening. Um, and even, even at that, I, I can say the, the uh, kind of a funny story. Very early on, I was 12, in the first couple of weeks, uh, we had an incident where the, the vacuum cleaner went on fire. And uh, the owner of the pub called a team meeting. Imagine 12 year olds with 12 to 14, uh, four or five of us brought together and he explained that uh, the vacuum cleaner had gone on fire. He had to pay money to get it fixed. And it was a cigarette butt that had caused the problem. And uh, over the course of the team meeting, he said uh, he'd have to ask us that we wouldn't smoke while we were hoovering anymore. Uh, so it's 12 year olds. But uh, he, he, he can imagine being at, at a team meeting when you're 12. I, I don't know when I was at my next team meeting. I was probably well into my career before it happened. So lessons learned really in the workplace and informing uh, myself for the future. Back to school, third year is junior search year or intercept as it was then. I went off to Cliff Edge. You, we just, you can't get away without reading. So it, the necessity to read is part of the uh, education system. I went uh, on a downward spiral and exam results went off the, the page. I was too young to do the intercert, which was great. So I progressed through to fifth year. Uh, without actually seeing a state exam. The comments on my report, and these are, oh, these are oh, shocking really, it's a uh, need to concentrate, could do better, and needs to work harder. I was trying to concentrate. Uh, I was doing my best. I, I don't read the way other people read, and the system of education didn't work for me, and I was working very hard. So I think, you know, we need to consider those comments, and particularly parents and grandparents, you know, we see those comments, uh, here, let's, let's look beyond the comment and see if there's something else happening uh, for, for, for the child. Uh, come back to uh, school then, fifth year, I had to do fifth year twice because I was too young. I'd lost complete interest in school, uh, became a bit of a class clown. I think Jane McGrath mentioned that in her talk as well. Uh, the teachers generally lost interest. They didn't bother me if I didn't bother them. So I was uh, happily walking in a pub and uh, attending the school, shall we say. Sixth year, uh, uh, interesting times. I'm still in the A class, uh, definitely not bothered by the teachers, seeing as a bit of a clown, but gained some respect and certainly gained respect from some teachers and from some of my peers. One incident that uh, is relevant was near the end, uh, one particular teacher went round the class. I have no idea why he was doing this business, but he went round the class, asked us all what we would like to do uh, when we moved on and when we moved into careers. And I said, I would like to teach. And he laughed. He said, ha ha, well, yes, one is not going to happen. So 16-year-old me, uh, sixth year, secondary school, and uh, really, uh, you know, that's, that's a bit of a put down. But, uh, you know, came back, uh, the circle came right around. 
walked in, uh, left school, managed to pass all the subjects in the Leaving Cert um, by some miracle, and uh, then went working full time in a pub. I was seen by uh, a guy who worked in Anco in the pub, and he gave me a break, got me a position in Jacobs as a trainee lab technician, which was through Anco. The idea was that uh, I would progress through and become a lab technician. Uh, the leaving search results when they came out that kind of puts put paid to that idea so um that was the end of my career as a lab technician but then uh joined the workforce i worked in in a meat company as a cost clerk numbers again so i'm pretty okay at that then joined the post office um interacting with people became something that i, I was pretty good at and i worked in the post office savings bank so i got to know the products but continued through a series of, of lower positions in the civil service and uh, continued um, working, working in the pubs as well. Um, next time in a moment then comes is the realisation that there is something amiss. And this is the one I mentioned it to Arlene Harris in the Irish Independent, the Sunday Independent. Um, I, I was married in 1982, uh, age 21, and reading uh, was then, I suppose, the Netflix of, of now, and uh, there were various authors and people read, and my wife and I started to, to read, and I can remember reading in bed and her pages flicking, and mine not. And I'm kind of saying, you know, you need to read that, you can't just flick the pages. I said, I am reading it, and uh, I kind of had dawning that, oh, hold on a second, uh, there's something different here, and something amiss. But uh, progressed through, um, and then, uh, as uh, Nicola mentioned at the start, I had my next seminar moment, which was my arrival into the world of computer programming. And uh, that was, again, through a series of uh, civil service where we're promoting people into computer programming positions. I applied, did the actual test, and was successful. And I learned PL1, which is a programming language, an IBM programming language. And suddenly, I could read. I can read computer code. I can see it. It's a language, but it has only about 150 words. We only really use about 90 of them. It's absolutely structured and completely lacking in ambiguity. It, it is a, a thing of, of beauty, really, from the point of view of its lexic. There's, there's no double meanings at all. There's a, 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 an apostrophe, a quote, a semicolon, a comma. They have definite meaning. And computers do what they're told and keep doing it until they're still told to stop doing it. So that was something I found a place in life as a computer programmer. And I also uh, can remember there was a colleague there at the time and he spoke once of um, dyslexia. It's the first time I ever heard of it. And I thought it was this lexia he was talking about. And he spoke about how B's and D's were mixed up. And because that, that wasn't the case for me, so I forgot about it. But uh, again, he heard, heard the mention of the world. I progressed again through uh, the world of programming uh, to become an analyst programmer, which is about designing systems about uh, looking at problems and coming up with solutions. And is, is the ideal world for a dyslexic thinker. And we'll talk about dyslexic thinking before we, we finish up. And unlike a lot of dyslexics, I uh, had this ambition uh, or need, I think, to prove myself. So I, I put myself forward for, for promotions and I ended up in a management position uh, as the operations manager with AirTrade, which was the forerunner to aircom.net. Next seminal moment uh, comes in 1991 at the age of 30. And this is every dyslexic's most seminal moment. It's diagnosis. Diagnosis is what it's about. It's the moment of relief. Suddenly there's a confirmation that you're not tick. And, uh, and that's, that's a common theme across uh, dyslexia is this, this idea that, you know, I, I'm a bit tick, I can't read. You're not alone. There's a weight lifted off you and there's a boost to confidence. And in preparing for, for, for today, I've spoken to a number of dyslexic friends and they've all said, uh, you know, that that moment is the moment when it's lifted. And I will, at the end, I'll give some recommendations. And if anybody is here and they have any feeling that they may be dyslexic, do contact the Dyslexia Association of Ireland and have yourself tested. And believe me, it will be a weight off your mind if it turns out that uh, you, you are a member of our community. Next up, I... I went back to education and I went back to the Open University in 1991, age 31. And just, just the Open University is an amazing place. And the word open, it started out, uh, Harold Wilson spoke about the University of the Air at the Labour, Labour Party conference. 
he got got into government and he uh, asked Jenny Lee to to pursue it. She had her first meeting in June 1965, which is when I was first year in school, and uh, the idea was that this was going to be given an opportunity to people who hadn't had the opportunity to go to university. Uh, and it was very much about economic circumstances, but I was uh, I was a collateral gainer from that because uh, university wasn't for me because uh, I was uh, diverse in some way and many other people were. And just looking at the Open University, we we're open first as to people, we we're open as to places, we we're open as to methods, and finally we we're open as to ideas. Um, it worked for me because it, they offered a structured building blocks, and that was from the start. Harold Wilson said that they need to be able to build build blocks towards qualification. Uh, access was what it was about. A lot of the stuff was confirming what I knew. I was working as a manager. I was studying management, and uh, it was confirming what 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 I, I knew. Um, study groups were encouraged. I got into a study group and spoke to Ray McKenna, who I think is here uh, this morning. Ray. Um, we were had a study group meeting once and we were coming out of it and um, Ray said to me, I wish I could read the stuff the way you read it. And I hadn't read it at all. But what I was doing was listening to what people were saying in the study group and playing it back and playing to my uh, abilities and everybody was gaining from it. And another nice story about the Open University is Paolo Rary was our first honorary doctorate, doctor of the university. And he's the man who brought reading of all things to people in Brazil. Who had missed out on education. Next seminal moment uh, is age 36, 1997. Uh, I started to do some lecturing with the University of Limerick. Uh, a lucky break, very peculiar interview. I, uh, they, I was working for Telecom Air at the time. We had been partially bought by uh, Telia and uh, KPN, the Dutch and Swedish telephone companies. And Telia were uh, going to send some people on the program in the University of Limerick. And it was to be done online of all things. This is 1997. I did the interview and they mentioned at the interview that I needed an SDNI line. I said, uh, is it ISDN? They said, yes, we're getting one to college. I said, I have one at home. So uh, they immediately gave me the job. It didn't work out. The online stuff didn't happen. But I ended up working with the University of Limerick for many years on the diploma in project management. I found my calling. I uh, found something I like doing something that I was pretty okay at. And I can remember the first day working with a group in the hospital in Tullamore, actually, the, the Midland Health Board. And I stood in front of the room and I, I talked back to the day the teacher laughed at me uh, and said I wouldn't, uh, that my, my ambition wouldn't come true. So we were 20 years on and I had uh, achieved that ambition. And that was, that was a personal, very personal goal for me. 2005 then, uh, I... Uh, applied for work as an associate for the National College of Ireland, where I work now, and uh, developed into a more variety of um, courses, working with uh, adult learners and really realising my ambition of, of, I call myself a facilitator of learning rather than a lecturer, because that's, that's focused on what's happening in the room rather than what I'm doing, and the use of storytelling to facilitate learning. Um, I developed those skills and honed those skills uh, while working in industry at the same time. Uh, again, just not a dyslexic thing, but I put myself out there and I, uh, well, an American company came to look for me and uh, I took up a job. And I think that was a need to prove myself, to prove that I could actually do it in the commercial world. You know, we, we, we dyslexic have doubt all the time and you're doubting, you know, I'm working in, in the semi state sector. Maybe uh, I have a cushion there. Maybe I won't survive in the real world. So I got out there in the real world and I did survive and I managed it for, for 10 years until the economic crash when I found myself uh, in a position that uh, I was seeking work. Uh, and that's where my new career started. I started to work as an associate lecturer in two colleges. Um, change of focus, but still enjoying it. Suddenly lecturing was the source of my income. Um, I moved into National College of Ireland into an admin job, kept... Uh, my associate work going and then uh, five years ago I followed my dream and moved into a full-time position in the School of Business as a lecturer and um, I'm actually in a lucky position now that I work half-time as a lecturer. My title is lecturer but I consider myself to be a facilitator of learning. Next seminal moment for me and for all dyslexics was some weeks ago LinkedIn listed dyslexic thinking as a skill. 
I think that's a hugely important step forward. I was one of the first up, straight up, I have it in my profile, dyslexic thinker. I'm so proud to say that because dyslexic thinking, as I said earlier, we read differently, we think differently, and we learn differently. And dyslexic thinking is something that the, the world needs and will need as we, as, we move, as we move on. So about dyslexic thinking, uh, what is it? It's about creativity, problem solving, seeing the big picture, recognizing patterns, thinking on your feet. And they're all things uh, that they're not, I'm not, I, I Googled this and found it out. And the other one, and this is the bugbear of mine, is the, the ability to think outside the box. And I always kind of thought, where did the box come from? Why would you be in a box in the first place? So, uh, you know, dyslexics, we do see outside the box. The, 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 the if you listed the, pro, the requirements for a systems developer, you know, they're pretty much clo closely aligned to, to the dyslexic thinking skill set. And I think there's a cruel irony in the fact that dyslexia evolved out of the printing press, effectively, in the Industrial Revolution, when the dissemination of information started to happen in the written form. We're now in the fourth Industrial Revolution, and I really think we need dyslexic thinkers, and we need to, to bring dyslexic thinkers into organizations, because a lot of the programmed decisions are going to be made by machines. Uh, predictive typing, predictive text is happening, and uh, we do seriously need to embrace dyslexic thinking. Uh, as I said, the technology is, is moving with us. Pretty good text was, was a start. We now have Microsoft actually almost typing the emails before we, 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 we send. Uh, YouTube is there. What a great resource. You know, the days of actually looking at the manual are nearly gone. You can get a YouTube, show me how to do it, pause it, do it, and uh, it really works. I do quite a bit of bicycle maintenance cycle is my hobby and uh, I will, will try anything if somebody can show me how to do it and they, 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 it does happen. Um, in my work I uh, speak my feedback to students now. I've gone paper free assignments and uh, if you consider you know presenting feedback to somebody on an assignment it, typing this is an excellent piece of work it's, it's mundane it's down to the nuance of of their interpretation whereas if, if you speak it you can this is an excellent piece of work and, uh, and that has, uh, it's to my environmental friendly as well. And our world is changing. Uh, Standard & Poor's started Fortune 500 in 1955, and 89% of those companies don't exist today. In fact, 61 of them exist today. So that's, that's where it's going. And you know, the ones that do exist today, like Google, like uh, Facebook, like Apple, Dell, uh, who knows what, what's, what technology is going to happen and what direction they're going to go. Okay, so just some reflections. I'm, I'm in a comfortable position. I'm doing a job I love. I can pay my bills and I can live comfortably. So that, that is a measure of success. I'm not Richard Branson. I'm not Walt Disney. I'm not John Lennon. All of them dyslexics, by the way. I'm not Albert Einstein, another dyslexic. But I, I have achieved a level of success. And we often hear bandied around the words in spite of and because. And I would say that where I'm at now is in spite of the Irish education system, not because of it, but I would say it's definitely because of my dyslexia and not in spite of it. I think it's an important, uh, important uh, way to think about it. I do, like all dyslexics, suffer from imposter syndrome. And that is because there is a deep down confidence. We've been hiding something all our lives and the fear is somebody is going to find us out. Somebody is going to catch us. That said, it is a great time to be dyslexic. And I think parents and grandparents should think about that. Recognize the disability, but also recognize as a gift. Salesforce advertised uh, some weeks ago for apprentice software developers and they stated in the ad, dyslexics are encouraged to apply. They also mentioned our other neurodiverse cousins, but specifically mentioned dyslexics. Well, that's a really good thing to do. And it's an altruistic thing for Salesforce to do. Actually, dyslexic thinking is what they need for software developers. So it's a win for both. I think we should embrace dyslexia. We should embrace dyslexic thinking. Do you think reading is actually disappearing? The need to read is going to be uh, gone, I reckon, within the next five to 10 years. Uh, my wife, who is listening in downstairs, has, you know, if you consider her progress from this page turner to an e-reader, and uh, 
I, I listen to stuff all the time. Uh, I find because I listen, my oral perception is quite good. I put to put up the double speed and listen to stuff. So I think uh, it's it's moving away from it. UDL, Universal Design for Learning, or UD, just Universal Design is happening. We're, there's an acceptance of the fact that we don't all learn the same way and we need to learn for, for different styles. I think from the Department of Education and the education systems perspective, we, we need to move away from what I'm looking at is a concern for the administration of education, whereas it should be a concern for the facilitation of learning. I think that's a shift that needs to happen. For somebody with dyslexia, uh, I think it is essential to play to our strengths. Focus on what we're good at. Um, James Northridge in his talk spoke about technology. And we need to do that. Find what we're good at. Find what works for us and then focus on that. Monomics don't work for me. Um, analogies do work for me. And, and that's, that's, that's how it is. So uh, that's what, the way I work. Um, one thing I've said a couple of times is it's not that we weren't good at school. School wasn't good at us. Just think about that. And if there's any young people listening here who, who are dyslexic, just think about that. Say it again. It's not that you're not good at school. School is not good at you. And school needs to get good at you because that's what needs to change. Absolutely get tested. Uh, anyone who has any inkling to the fact that they have a reading difficulty should get tested. If anyone wants to follow up with me, uh, I, my details are with the Dyslexia Association and just pop a message to the Dyslexia Association and they will, they will uh, may, make a contact with me. Um, I'm going to wind up on a poem which is a little bit more positive. Uh, the poem is called The Gift and uh, I hope it gives positivity to, to people out there. So um, if we could, let's see, uh, it's called The Gift. Doesn't read like others do, yet comes across as one well read. Seems to think with greater depth, learning in a different way. Expects little from the world, xyresic wit on display. Immensely deep in thought and mind, aware of self and those around. They say his brain is all miswired and try to get him to conform, to learn like them by the book and limit his mind to their own way. How can they know what it's like to have the gift that they do not? To not be tied to written words and see the world in a different way. They should keep their notions to themselves and stop enforcement of their norms, which only serve to inhibit thought of those with higher order minds. The world would be a better place if difference wasn't pushed away, if encouragement was there for all to function as they were born to do. If only fear could be allayed, we'd all be in a better place. Each could play to their strengths and gifts and talents could work for all. Thank you.